Okay, thank you very much to uh, the organizers. Thank you for having me here. Uh, unfortunately, Jim Wilkinson and I never uh, shared time on this earth at the same time, but I have worked with and known many who did know him personally, and I think that a lot of his legacy has, has trickled down to me in terms of mathematics, humor, and support of young people. And so I'll, I'll begin today with a, a nice quote that comes uh, from an article. This is uh, not the one that's included in the pamphlet today, but uh, uh, appears on the ACM Turing Award website by Beresford Parlett. And he says this um, in a much more humorous and eloquent way than I ever could, but he says the, essentially that the, the cost of speed in computing is, is that almost every answer we get is wrong. And so our motivation is to, uh, to build efficient and sufficiently accurate computations in spite of these rounding errors. And so when I say computation here, uh, there are many aspects of a computation. We're talking about the original actual problem we're trying to solve, um, the method that we use to solve the problem, the algorithm that we use to solve the problem down to the specific implementation. And really the role of the algorithm here is what plays a role in kind of the structure of our rounding errors. And so it's important to differentiate between the accumulation of rounding errors, which is really an, inev an inevitable part, well part of uh, finite precision computation, and the amplification of rounding errors, which is really a property of the mathematical structure <coughs> of the transformation of the data imposed by our algorithm. All right, so my example today will be a, in iterative Krilov subspace methods and specifically <coughs> conjugate gradient algorithms. All right, so I have here two kind of textbook algorithms for the CG method. Okay, so the left being that due to Hastenis and Stiefel, and on the right, this is uh, uh, another version due to Stiefel and, and also developed by Rudishauser. Okay, so this version on the left, um, this is uh, the version that is based on having three two-term recurrences. So we have uh, our approximate solution vector, our residual vector, and a direction vector that we're updating. On the right, uh, the basically the idea is here, here we're computing kind of the LU factors independently of the Jacobi matrix T, and here we're actually kind of doing a two, three-term recurrences which, which compute the entries in this tridiagonal matrix. Um, and so this is a kind of a very slight change. Uh, these two algorithms, if you ran them in infinite precision, they would give you the same answers. Um, and so the question is, can finite precision behavior really be that much different between the two? So I'll, I'll talk about this in terms of maximum attainable accuracy of the methods. And so without going into details, I'll just say that the attainable accuracy uh, here is typically bounded in terms of the size of the, the gap between the two residuals. So the true residual B minus AX, where this X has you know, some rounding errors that have been accumulated there, and this recursively updated residual, which is also independently of X accumulating rounding errors. Okay, so it was uh, shown by Anne Greenbaum in a paper in 1997 that for CG and other uh, recursively updated residual methods, that the bound on the residual gap here can be written as essentially just an accumulation of local rounding errors. Right, so using this F to stand for my residual gap, so the residual gap in iteration I will be whatever my initial gap was, right, plus a, a summation of local rounding errors where this delta X is the error I make in updating X and the delta R is what I make in updating R. Okay, so it was shown that, that for this, this alternative version that uses three-term uh, recurrences, that the attainable accuracy can be much, wor much worse uh, than in, in the version that uses two-term recurrences. And this was shown in a paper in 2000 by uh, Gutnick and Zdeniek Strakos. And specifically, if you look at the details of this error analysis, you can show that the residual gap is bounded by a sum of local errors plus the local errors amplified right, by factors that depend on these ratio of residuals here. Right, and so we know, in particular in the conjugate gradient method, we're not minimizing the residual norm, we're minimizing the A norm of the error, so there's no, no reason to expect this residual norm to decrease monotonically. And in particular, in cases where we have large oscillation in the residual, that means that, the, that this uh, method can suffer from large amplification of rounding errors in contrast to, to the Hastinius and Stiefel version. Okay, and so here's just a new numerical example run in MATLAB. Right, so this is a, a small problem from the sweet sparse collection. So here I'm plotting the relative uh, accuracy versus the iteration. And this black line is the two-term recurrence version. The red line is the three-term <coughs> recurrence version. And so you can see that there, 
there is a, a big gap here in, in the attainable accuracy for this particular problem. Yes, and so this is another good thing to point out, is that even, even the Hestenius and Stiefel version, this is a hard problem for that. We're taking you know, more than eight iterations to, uh, eight n iterations to converge here, yes. Okay, so there are, um, I, I could give a, a whole lecture or a whole course even on uh, other variants of CG that have been developed uh, going back you know, as much as 50 years motivated by solving large scale problems on large scale machines. And so one recent example, which I'll, I'll just give an example of, is the, what's called the pipeline CG method due to Geisels and Van Roos. And so the main idea here is that you are want to introduce some auxiliary vectors. Right? And so here, instead of computing A times P, I'll recursively update this, this vector S that stands for A times P and some others. And doing this allows you to decouple uh, the inner products and the sparse matrix vector products so that they can be overlapped. And this will kind of hide, hide the communication cost in some way. So here's just a, a small depiction of, of what an, uh, one of these iterations looks like. And so using non-blocking MPI communication, you could accomplish these at the same time. Okay, so but it's important to ask how, how adding these auxiliary vectors is going to affect the numerical behavior and the structure of the rounding errors. So to do that, let's just look at a, a very simplified, OK, I don't know what happened there. So <laughs> all right, a very simplified version of this pipeline method where I'm just using one additional auxiliary vector, just this S, which stands for A times P. So I'm just going to take the Hestinis and Stiefel version, and just the only changes I'm making are I'm going to, you know, instead of using computing A times P, I'll, I'll plug in this S. And then I have a recurrence for updating that S. Did the authors propose this method because it was faster but didn't worry about the errors? Uh, <laughs> yes. So yes, this it was motivated by by speeding up each iteration. But they have subsequently, uh, yeah. So here, um, there's this is this is a paper we worked on, which is a more general case. But they look at analyzing uh, things. You know, so four years later, they got around to that. Um, and so if we look at the max maximum attainable accuracy, and, and this is not the full version, this Geisels and Van Roos version, this is just the simplified version with one additional vector. Right, and so here we can show that the, the uh, residual gap in iteration i, again, will be the initial gap. Again, we have this summation of the, the local rounding errors, but we have this additional term here. Okay, and if we look more, more closely at what this is, right, and so here in this expression for this g, here is the gap uh, between you know, the, the A times P and, and the S that I'm updating. And notice here that, that this quantity is amplified by this product uh, of these uh, coefficients beta that I compute. And so you can show, in ex at least in exact arithmetic, you can write this expression that this product of the, these betas, again, is, is a ratio of residual norms. So really, this, this looks a lot like the result that we had uh, for, for the three-term recurrence version of CG. So if we just take the two-term recurrence version, the Hestinis and Stiefel version, we just add one auxiliary vector to it, and all of a sudden it looks like, like this three-term recurrence version. All right, so this very small change can cause an amplification of rounding errors. And to show you the same example problem here in the red line is the simple pipeline CG version, which with just the one auxiliary vector. Uh, you can imagine if you did the, the Geisels and Van Roos version with two additional auxiliary vectors, uh, things get even worse. Okay. Okay. So the the takeaway is that even small changes we make to algorithms can cause rounding errors to be amplified, and in this particular case, the amplification factors will de depend on the size of the residual oscillations. Okay. And so I'll stress that the the bounds uh, might be far from tight. This doesn't mean that these methods will never work. Um, but the important thing here is the insight that you get from the bounds. And this is echoed in this very nice quote of Wilkinson in this same review article. Uh, the emphasis here is my own. Right? So he says, the bound itself is usually the least important part of it. And really the idea here is the, the, the valuable thing is the insight that we obtain can be used to, to develop improved algorithms. And I think this should really be our goal. OK. And so in, in the context uh, um, <coughs> of HPC, this is uh, particularly important to, to pay attention to how any changes we make to speed things up might actually have a, an effect on, on the finite precision behavior. Right? And so we have to be careful because in this case, the effects of the finite precision behavior can really negate any potential performance benefit. Uh, we might have our convergence might be significantly delayed, so we don't actually save anything. 
and we might not be able to attain the accuracy required by whatever application we're running uh, at the higher level. Okay, and I'll also just mention that I only talked about attainable accuracy, but of course, and especially for, for optimizing high performance computations, the convergence rate is also very important, but this is a, a kind of something that's kind of harder to talk about. Um, and this is something that, for all these CJ, CG methods, suffers from amplification of rounding errors. Okay, so uh, another, another quote from Wilkinson, the same time review article, again, the emphasis mine. Uh, I really like this, that attractive mathematics does not protect one from the rigors of digital computation. <laughs> this is important to keep in mind. Okay, so looking forward, all right, so the, here's uh, yes, the, this uh, ACE machine, and here Jack already showed a picture of this. This is Summit machine at, at Oak Ridge. Um, and so it's, uh, you know, the computers that we have today are similar in some ways to these machines, but they're also very different in a lot of ways. Um, and one thing in particular is the, tr the trend of multi-precision and low-precision uh, capabilities in the hardware. I think uh, moving forward, it's uh, again especially important to pay attention to the structure of the amplification of the rounding errors in this context because amplification factors that were small in double precision now can, can kind of render our algorithms unusable. Right? So, so just to make a, you can see this as kind of doing, doing precision uh, computation in half precision is like if we were doing a single computation in double precision but with an amplification factor of around 10 to the 12. Okay, so these, these new hardware brings with it a number of interesting challenges from the perspective of numerical analysis, meaning new number formats uh, beyond the IEEE standard, um, developing uh, efficient algorithms and implementations that can make use of this hardware in certain parts of the computations, doing analysis of multi-precision algorithms, and kind of refining our notions of ill-conditioning and techniques used in error analysis to see what will work in half-precision. All right. And so I, I just to, to finish up, I think um, Wilkinson, uh, you've, you've heard from Sven about his, his life's work. Uh, he really had a unique perspective on things. He had uh, experience with applications. He had experience in actually building machines and hardware design. He had experience in implementing algorithms and also doing the analysis of those algorithms. Um, and that this truly gave him a, a bird's eye view of the whole numerical computational process you know, from the applications all the way down to the metal. And I think it's very rare in today's world to, to so for someone to have this broad of a perspective with, with also, also expertise in these individual areas. And so I think moving forward, uh, the, the biggest breakthroughs that we can make in numerical mathematics and high-performance computing have to be inherently interdisciplinary. Right, so we, we don't all have Wilkinson's broad perspective, but combined, we can somehow try and replicate that to move forward. Okay, thank you very much for your time. Right, thank you, Aaron. Uh, please. Yeah. It's coming. I usually don't, e usually don't need a microphone. <laughs> uh, I want to quibble with you about the difference between amplification and accumulation. Okay. You talked about amplification rounding errors. That's mm -hmm. mainly what it's about. It's not about accumulation. Mm -hmm. Accumulation means doing lots of arithmetic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That isn't what's going on here. It's, it's norms of things getting big mm -hmm. uh, and getting magnified. Mm -hmm. So I would, I would just, don't, don't use accumulated uh, rounding errors. You're not accumulating rounding errors. No, you're magnifying you, them. You wouldn't call this this um, this simple summation of local rounding errors in the Hestenius and Stiefel version an accumulation. That was but what I was meant to, to contrast yeah. with. But 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 your your results well, the it, it, you don't have anything in here that depends on the number of arithmetic operations you do. It's not because you do a large number of arithmetic sure. operations. Sure. Well, it can. That's summation. It's a summation over many, many iterations. So it depends on how many iterations you do. I would say whether that's a problem or not. It's a summation over many iterations. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much for your last comment about the interdisciplinarity. I fully uh, subscribe to that, mm -hmm. and actually. I usually put that on my slides, but I didn't get to it. I got and, you. And, and uh, it's very nice, but uh, 
I, I want to follow this up in a little bit of provocation to Jack, uh, in a certain sense. Maybe the times that we can write a black box uh, machinery that then everybody can take from the shelves and use it for their practical problem, uh, we should rethink this philosophy. And I'm, I'm happy to discuss this in more detail, but uh, just getting the computers bigger and and making LAPAC and Scalapac to run better on a on a new architecture may not be the solution to the problem. I think to bring in the information about the physics of the problem behind and our, uh, is is as important, I think, as as getting the software going. Mm -hmm. Do you want to comment on that first, uh, or uh, I, I can? Uh, <laughs> I, would, I would agree. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Important, yeah. So there's no yeah, disagreement yeah, sure. there. Sure. Um, but I, I think that uh, the black boxes are, are needed uh, for many applications, so I think it plays a valuable uh, role uh, ultimately. I, I also agree. This is absolutely true. If, if you want to get the, the best performance you possibly can if you want to kind of eke out every, every flop you can. It has to be based on, on the underlying problem. Okay, well let's start again for the talk. Thank you.